Hello everybody and welcome to Theology 101. Today we are going to look at the book of Amos. The book of Amos is the 30th book of the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible has three sections, the law, prophets, and writings. The law contains the first five books of the Old Testament. The prophets is made up of eight books divided into the former prophets and the latter prophets. The latter prophets include books such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets. The writings consist of religious poetry and wisdom literature, and Amos is part of the 12 minor prophets section of the Old Testament. Now when I say a book is considered a minor prophet, I'm not referring to its importance, but to its length. In other words, the 12 books called the minor prophets are shorter than the major prophets. Let me give you the historical background of Amos. During Amos's time, this was called the Silver Age in Israel's history. The Golden Age referred to the time of King David and Solomon, where Israel was established as one nation. After Solomon, Israel experienced a lot of wars, hardships, and trials. This led to Israel splitting into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. But after several dark years in the valley, Israel became wealthy and their economy started to rise out of the ashes. During the Silver Age, Israel was not at war with other nations, and they were even at peace with Judah, the southern kingdom. Israel was able to reassert themselves as a world power with their military conquests, and they started to expand their territories and extend their borders. The geographic expansion of Israel's borders led to a new supply of taxes from defeated enemies. The upper class in Israel were living the most comfortable lives they could ever dream of, and people assumed that their economic status was a sign of God's blessing. Now, one of the reasons why Israel assumed that God was on their side was because they were very religious. Israel still went to temple to worship God, observed the Jewish festivals and holidays, and did what a religious Jew would do. In fact, unlike Judah in the south, they didn't perform child sacrifices to idols and seemed to live very moral lives. So why does God feel a need to send the prophet Amos to Israel with a message about judgment? This leads to the purpose of the book. God judges Israel because their love for God did not translate to their love for other people. Israel did not care for the poor, oppressed, and the widows within their nation. Instead of using their wealth to alleviate the sufferings of others, they used it to upgrade their lifestyle. For example, when Amos visited Israel, he was overwhelmed by their wasteful and luxurious lifestyle. Amos visited one of their funeral banquets in Samaria where he saw the meat that they ate, the expensive wines that they drank, the imported oils that they used, and the ivory on their furniture. And he was disgusted with what he saw. He saw how the poor were oppressed by merchants who cheated them with dishonest scales. He saw how the wealthy charged high rents to the poor to use their farmland. Israel's problem was that they did not love their neighbor with their wealth, but used their wealth selfishly. Whereas Judah's sin was very clear as seen through the worship of Baal and other idols, Israel's sin was more subtle in their lack of compassion for the poor. Now, who is Amos? Interestingly, his name means burden. A lot of times, the meaning of the prophet's name informs us about their message and mission. So for Amos, we see that God has called them to carry a burden. Why will it be such a burden for Amos to bring a message to Israel? First, Amos did not grow up in Israel. He was from Judah, the southern kingdom. So he was an outsider. Second, Amos was not a trained prophet. He was not qualified, at least in people's eyes, to bring a message from God. You see, Amos lived during the time of the golden age of Hebrew prophets. In the north in Israel, Amos and Hosea were prophets, while in the south in Judah, Isaiah and Micah were prophets. So Amos's contemporaries were some of the greatest prophets of all time, Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah. But notice what is different about Amos. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the sons of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Amos was not a trained prophet, but a shepherd. Now, when I say shepherd, I think we picture a poor shepherd sleeping on a green hill or something. But later we see that is not the case. I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore fig. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Instead of calling himself a shepherd, Amos says that he was a herdsman. A herdsman was a person who managed several flocks and shepherds worked under him. So Amos was a businessman. Also, he traded sycamore figs. Sycamore fruit was a seasonal fruit and required travel from Tekoa, the place where Amos was from, to Galilee, which was in the north. So Amos had traveled a lot, which would explain why he had extensive knowledge of international events during his time. If you look at how Amos 
Amos debates with religious leaders, he was clearly a very learned person. Amos knew the history of Israel and the history of the nations around Israel. He knew Israelite politics, society, and religion. He had enough courage to confront the rich who oppressed the poor, religious leaders, and greedy landowners. So Amos was not just a random shepherd. He was a successful businessman who was very learned. And God called him to leave his hometown, go to Israel, and deliver a burdensome message to the rich and elite in Israel. Now why did God choose a businessman, as opposed to a trained prophet, to bring a message condemning the rich in Israel? This is why. Professional prophets were compensated by donation from God's people or were sponsored by the government. But Amos was not a professional prophet, so he didn't need donations. This meant that Amos was free to say whatever God wanted him to say without being afraid of his livelihood. Keep in mind the audience that Amos will be preaching to. They were rich. How do you think they would respond to a prophet who depended on their donations? They would pressure the prophet to change his message or else cut off his funding. But Amos would be immune to this threat. Also, Amos wasn't poor, but probably rich himself. So he knew how rich people thought and operated. People could not accuse Amos of being jealous or starting some revolution to punish the rich. No, God used Amos because Amos knew how to talk to rich people. He has seen how they live. He has rubbed shoulders with them. He has done business with them. So God chooses Amos to bring a message of condemnation to the rich in Israel because they neglected the poor. Although they remain religious, God is going to judge them. Why? The issue was not that they were rich. The issue was that they were selfish with their riches. Look at how God describes them. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. He calls the rich women in Israel cows because they were so selfish and just continue buying more stuff while ignoring the poor. Then look at what God says later. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. So you are seeing the picture of Israel. The book of Amos gives us a picture of God's heart for the poor by condemning the rich for failing to love them. God does not only care about how we worship him, but also how we use our money to love others. Thank you to today's sponsor, On Reverence. They offer a free digital worship music app called Maskill. If you want to find out more, I'll leave some links below in the description box. If you missed the last video about the book of Joel, I'll leave a link here for you to watch. And until next time, see you.